Over a lifetime, women spend an average of around two years in front of a mirror. And during those two years, we obsess over our appearances. We try to make ourselves look more natural, less natural, glowier, dewy skinned or bronzed. The list goes on and on. But why do we think this makes us look more beautiful? Where did these ideas of beauty even come from? I'm Emma Dabry. I'm an author, sociologist, and someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about beauty. Today, I'm going to delve into my beauty bag and the history behind some of these tools to explain what they tell us about modern day beauty standards. So, let's unzip the bag. When I was a teenager in Ireland, like my white peers, I was an enthusiastic user of fake tan. I still recall that sharp, tangy chemical fragrance and the uniquely streaky orange effect achieved. While subscribing to a very Irish norm at the time, it wasn't one necessarily designed with my complexion in mind. But there is an interesting history there. People often associate the history of tanning with Coco Chanel getting sunburned during a holiday in the south of France. But there's another less known influence on this enduring beauty standard. Back in 1925 at the Folie Bergère, a cabaret music hall in Paris, a black American actress and dancer became an overnight sensation. Her name was Josephine Baker. People idolized her and French women wanted to look like her. So she launched Baker Skin, a skin darkening lotion marketed to wealthy white Parisian women desperate to achieve the famous Baker look. And it worked. To this day, tan skin has remained an aspiration for many. Next up, we have a compact mirror. For thousands of years, people have gone to amazing lengths to see their own reflections. Some of history's first mirrors were made by polishing materials like obsidian, bronze and copper. And mirrors have long been associated with vanity. In the Greek myth of Narcissus, a young man who was renowned for his beauty was cursed by the gods to fall in love with his own reflection. He was so obsessed with the way he looked that he ended up wasting away and dying as he gazed at himself in the water. It's an extreme cautionary tale and we certainly can develop unhealthy relationships with our reflections. However, I would argue that self-care and processes of beautification are more than just vanity. While too much emphasis on physical appearance is misguided, unhealthy and potentially destructive, practices of adornment and beautification can be an important social time shared with others, as well as part of enjoying the experience of embodiment. The next thing in my bag is lipstick. Now, I have always loved makeup, but there was a point in my life where I just stopped wearing it completely. When I first started teaching at university, I wanted to be taken more seriously. So I ditched the lipstick and started dressing in a more serious fashion in order to look the part. These associations we have with beauty are subtle, but can be far reaching. And these assumptions can lead us to some pretty inaccurate conclusions about people and even historical figures. Take the Osei goddess. This statue was found in a storage vault in Paris in the 1900s. Greek statues are assumed to be white and representative of natural beauty, i.e. without makeup. But thanks to scientific advancements, we now know that this is not always the case. The Osei goddess would have had an olive or a light brown complexion. Her hair is possibly Afro-textured and looks like it's worn in a decorative, protective style with locks or ringlets hanging to her shoulders. She also appears heavily made up and is even rocking a red lip. What do we have next? This is a pintail comb, a helpful tool for sectioning and partitioning hair into braids. In traditional African cultures, beauty is integrated into everyday life. You see beauty expressed in the designs in cloth, in architecture, and also in elaborate hair braiding patterns. And no one is more familiar with the beauty of Nigerian hairstyles than J.D. Okai Ojikere. Ojikere was a photographer who took over a thousand photographs of many of the different ways that women would style their hair. And braids aren't just fashion. Hairstyles existed as markers of social status and distinction, your occupation, your marital status, demonstrating whether or not you had membership of a royal lineage or perhaps demonstrating which god you were a devotee of. A lot could be told about a person, as well as the values, ethics and priorities of their culture by their hairstyle. So there we have it, a whistle-stop tour through some of the products or tools I use or have used. 
There are always historical and cultural reasons behind the decisions we make, and it can help us understand the world a little better if we know a bit more about the processes that are informing our decisions. In the next video, we explore one of the biggest reasons why we might be made to feel anything but beautiful. Social media.